All right, what is up, people? Today, I'm going to be decoding, transcribing, notating, note for note, everything Mark Juliana's playing in this awesome Gretsch video. It's gonna be a long one, so if you get bored at some point, hopefully you don't, hopefully you stick around for it, but at the very end, I'm gonna show you the notation video of every single note and sticking he plays in this video. Uh, but if you do get bored, look along the bottom. I have no idea how long this is gonna take, so look along the bottom. I'm probably gonna put chapters of interesting fills that I transcribe and stuff, so. And here we go. The first step would be put everything in this program called transcribe. If I zoom out, I've marked every measure. There's 48 measures, so uh, let's get into it. Um, first, we have to set up our notation software, and the first thing I'm going to do is find the tempo. All right. It's 90 BPM, his 16th notes are slightly swung. By making that note, it means that like, I don't have to write tuplets or triplets for every single little thing in this transcription, only where like he plays the middle partial of some of the 16th note triplets. Um, so this makes the notation cleaner and it makes my job easier uh, transcribing it. All right, let's go. Oh, and for all you trolls that are like, you're gonna slow it down. Like, yeah, obviously technology's at my fingertips. Why wouldn't I slow it down? Um, why would you make it harder on yourself? So that's kind of what the process looks like for every single bar. Uh, I go ahead and get kind of the basic subdivision of hi-hat and stuff and find out where the big like kick and snare beats are. And then I go through and kind of figure out ghost notes and stuff. So that's kind of what the first measure looks like. So it's really important right there at the very end of that measure, that ghost note has a kick drum with it too. It's easy to hear the kick drum by itself or the ghost note by itself, but they're both happening together. So you wanna make sure you catch that. Measure three of 43. Uh, and just for people that maybe are wondering, so I add an accent over top of any snare drum that I consider a rim shot uh, or like a backbeat. 
Um, that's not necessary, but you know, to me, when you're transcribing, I think you can kind of do three different snare drum dynamics. One of them is the backbeat with like rim shot, which is where the accents are. There's ghost notes, but then sometimes there's a note that's kind of in between a ghost note and in between a rim shot. It's just kind of like a slightly louder, somewhere in the middle note. And I always want to leave room for that. So that's why I actually over every single backbeat, I'll add an accent. Can't really tell if he's playing the hi-hat on the end of beat one or he's just closing it. It's getting crazy. All right, our first 16th note triplet beat. Uh, finale sucks, so that's kind of how you have to do it, but whatever. getting somewhere people let's play a little game that i like to do sometimes sometimes i like to hear the measure once or twice and then try to fill it in without actually listening to it it's good to like push your brain to recall like that so let's listen one more time let's see if we can see if we can get it together it sounded like Uh, something like this, maybe? Ah, okay, so there's a kick drum on the last one. Let me see if there's a ghost note. I don't think there is a ghost note. That uh, snare drum is very snappy. So even when he's not playing the snare drum, there's a lot of like kick drum resonant frequency stuff going on that is making it sound possibly like he's playing a ghost note. If you're noticing, like he's doing such a beautiful job at building this drum solo, drum groove. It starts off with two bars of pretty much the same thing. And then he starts messing around with where he's opening the hi-hat. Then he starts peppering in more like couplets now he's removed the backbeat on beat two like he set up kind of the theme and the vibe and now he's just now starting to play with it move stuff around very cool all right so that very last beat is sex tuplets and I would usually put it on beat four because that's where it's supposed to go. But Finale does this thing where if you're doing a sex tuplet on the very last beat of a measure, it gets all screwed up. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. So it's uh, something like that, I think. No idea how long this video is going to be. I don't even know how I'm going to edit it, but we'll see. Oh. I 
I've always found when I'm using transcribe at the very beginning of measures, it's sometimes really valuable to scroll back a few frames and just make sure you're hearing things right because sometimes how videos are edited and like the sound you're getting, it's just important to hear all of this, the sound leading up to the transient of a downbeat that can sometimes give you information that's important. You might be thinking, why are you sitting here clicking every single note input? Uh, again, it's just because that's how I learned. I know there's like different shortcuts, but I've always found with drums, these notation programs are not really created with drummers in mind. So a lot of the shortcuts and stuff just aren't really designed to benefit drummers really. It really does look like he's playing that. I can't quite tell. You can't hear it, um, but it really does look like his hand is moving there. So I'm putting them in parentheses. It might just be that they're gated and, you know, he played them and it sounded like it in the room, but there's a gate on the tom or something. I'm not quite sure. All right, let's try it. Let's listen to this one more time and see if we can, again, let's test our brain, see if we can recall what he's playing. Uh-huh. Bump. Bump. Ah, shoot. I don't know beat three, but the last, there's a, I'll show you what goes last. This, this, this thing goes last, I think. I think it's tuplets on that last one. And it's a right, right, left. Checking what uh, sticking it was on the very last beat, but I think I was right. People, I think I was correct. I'm gonna write this all, this whole measure as 16th note triplets because he's playing a lot of like the very last or beat three or beat four is kind of a bunch of actual 16th note triplet stuff. So to keep this whole measure kind of congruent, I'm going to write it all through 16th note triplets so that it makes sense in context. Instead of just writing the, you know, 16th notes like I've been doing for most measures, since this is a bit more complex and since the latter half of the measure is going to have 16th note triplets, I'm going to write the whole thing in it. 
We got hi-hats on every eighth note. So I'm gonna do that because that helps anchor me. See, this is a good example of why I do the accent for the rim shots because some of these are not ghost notes, but they're not rim shots. Like those are rim shots, but on beat two, they're not rim shots. And I wanna be able to write that. Okay, Mark. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a nice little uh, nice little situation here. See, that's, that's something that I never would have played myself, which is, uh, you know, you always have the hardest time doing something you never would have done yourself. But I, I believe that's it. Let's go really slow. Yeah, I think that's it. Now we got something nice. So we got, I think we got two 16th note triplet things here. And then something like that, okay. So like for a measure like this, what I'll do is I'll get like the skeleton of the subdivision layout and then go through and fill out the orchestration of it because it helps me kind of conceptualize what's going on um instead of hold, doing it beat by beat i'll figure out kind of like the overall subdivision thing and then fill out what's playing where I think these are both the same. I think it's something like that. Now, here's a spot in a transcription and why it's valuable to go through and kind of place all your measure markers. He's starting to play with like where he's accenting and like where the downbeat is in some spots. And it's just important. It can be easy to kind of lose your footing like measures 15 and 16. He's kind of not always emphasizing beat one. It can be tricky and it can be easy to lose yourself. So like it's it's nice to go through the thing that you're about to transcribe and place all those markers first so you can make sure that as you get to the markers, you know they're placed where the downbeats are instead of kind of getting lost placing them as you go.
Also, I save very frequently. I've lost many a progress in a transcription because I wasn't saving enough. Such a musical phrase that he played. Again, I'm gonna do 16th note triplets through this whole thing. Isn't it annoying I have to switch to a different like input mode to put 16th note triplets? Yeah, I think that too. Slow it down. That's what I thought, just making sure. Rounding the hour mark, and we're right about halfway. Let's see if the second half is faster than the first. thing with this measure is like there's a lot going on because he is playing eighth notes with his splashed hi-hat foot um, but they're kind of he's not hitting it very tightly so they're kind of like sloshing all around and it, it does kind of sound like they're adding sub beats and stuff uh, especially when you're listening at like a slower tempo but um this is what he's doing i think The first beat is kind of all 16th note triplets, so is the last beat, but the rest are kind of just swung 16th notes, and that's how I'm gonna do it.
He is playing the bell, I think, or right near the bell, but he's not playing the bell like I would typically think of the bell, so I'm still notating it as regular ride symbol. I don't think he plays the right symbol there. But he does here. Yeah, you gotta catch that ride some on the very last beat. Oh yeah, here's the shit people showed up for. Let's get it. Let me put these hi-hats here and then let's listen to this one slow once I'm done with it. Just because, you know, I, I think a lot of people's misconception when they start transcribing is, man, this stuff is so crazy. It's so insane. Like what he's playing isn't that crazy. It's just kind of a formula. It's just kind of about how fast you can hear more than it is how fast you can play or anything. Like what he's playing isn't something you haven't heard before. It's just maybe something you wouldn't play and it's maybe not in the order you would play it in. Um, and yes, it is fast, but like as you're seeing right here, it's actually just 16th note triplets. It's actually kind of just groups of three broken up. So let's listen to it um, really slow. Let me actually put the stickings in here. Um, it's just kind of Got, it's it's playing with groups of three and breaking them up in different ways. So it's, again, he's playing it expertly uh, and musically, and it is fast when it's full speed, but it, it's nothing that scary. Like if you spent two weeks learning this measure, you could totally play it. Anyone could, even if they've never played drums before. Um, so here we go. So the beautiful thing about Mark's playing is that it's so musical. That's kind of the melody he's playing around with, and then the rest of it he's just filling it in.
I have a hat on now and a different shirt, the wardrobe changes because it's a different day. So uh, I'm like a little under an hour into this transcription. So we'll see if we can do the back half quicker than the first half. Okay, so this fill is a little strange because it's not like he's not perfectly placing some of these notes. So this is maybe with the first measure we're gonna have to do a little bit of interpretation. Um, so let's hear this again. So I do know that like the very end of this measure is um, blum bum bum ba. So it ends with this kind of like flammy, floor tommy, fill thing. So sometimes when a measure is really complicated, not that this is like overly complicated, but what I'll do is I'll kind of fill in the parts I know and that will help me narrow down like, okay, so here's what I know. How do I fill in the blanks? So it's kind of like solving an equation. You fill in what you know and then you're kind of left with what you don't know, so. So also, I got to figure out where beat one ends because he's kind of blurring some of these notes together. So on the first beat, we have uh, this thing and then we... And then we kind of have... We also have, so I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this actually as a rest because now I have to go to another layer and I'm actually gonna add these because the hi-hats are still technically doing like just regular eighth notes. So I'm gonna write it like that, all right? See, the right, the very beginning of beat one isn't quite like even. So, you know, my guess would be this was sex tuplets that kind of got weird and he, made it all work out. Because right there, it's a pretty clear, uh, like triplet thing. Let's do this whole measure and see what we got. That's that measure of insanity. Moving on. tricky part with that measure is right on the downbeat of beat three, there's a ghost note and a kick drum that plays together. And you can actually see him stick it. Uh, so it's just a tiny little detail. You got to be paying attention or else you'll miss it. Here's an example of when I actually do copy and paste. I tried to build kind of the beat over in another measure and then just drag over what I needed to replace.
to build this final beat, beat four in another fucking measure because finale is awful. I don't know why they make things so hard, but they do. So it's measures like this that are the hardest to transcribe. He's not playing anything crazy. It's just swung 16th notes. But it's such an unorthodox thing. In the, it, it's something you don't ever really hear. So this is the kind of thing that when you're transcribing it, it, you don't have any kind of preconceived notions about a measure like this because it is kind of so weird. His right hand's playing floor time, left hand's playing the hi-hat. Like, and it's very like uh, angular. So you know it's just kind of harder to hear some of these because it's something you're not accustomed to hearing. Like, if you just gave me that fill with no stickings, I never would have written that sticking down. This ghost note to me isn't where I would have, I wouldn't play that with the right hand usually. Um, even if I was going to play this as an open kind of open hi-hat floor tom thing, like the whole thing's just kind of backwards. Same with these floor toms, I would do right left. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that it's not tricky at all. It does just take a second. Tricky thing about this too is like he's playing open hi-hat with his hand and splashing the open hi-hat with his foot. So there's a lot of open hi-hat jangling around.
Oh, interesting. So he's actually like not really playing any of these. He's stepping them. Even better, he's not even playing these. Interesting, so that's why you always gotta stay on your toes and why video really helps. It's because I never would have guessed that those were all stepped hi-hats. I think that those last couple of hi-hat notes are pl played with a stick because you can tell they, they aren't quite as puffy. They have a little more articulation than when he plays with his foot, but it's pretty subtle. I'm just now noticing in the drum right here, you can actually see the shadow of his knee moving. which is super helpful, hilariously. Aha, and this confirms that the last couple, the last four hi-hat notes in the previous bar was uh, played with a stick because you can't see his knee moving, but here you can. Uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, forensic drum transcribing That's a cool little thing he's doing, which is stick on stick. I feel like when I was studying jazz in college, that's where you heard the most of that because like Philly Joe Jones and people would play like that. Um, and he's doubling it with the kick drum, which is cool. I love that he just totally biffs a rim shot right there. We all do it. It's good to see it when a superhuman drummer, you find out they aren't superhuman because he just absolutely whiffs a rim shot and hits rim. It sounds like he's also playing hi-hat there.
looks like he also is like bobbing his knee to this, but it really does sound like he's actually in his hand. His right hand disappears and it sounds more articulate. So I do think that those are actually played notes. Okay. Wow. So that's it. That's the whole transcription. That's four pages. Uh, 25. So this probably took about an hour and an hour and a half. So there you go. This is done. I'm going to roll the full transcription notation and everything so you can see kind of the work we just did together. Um, thanks so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if you like this. Um, put in the comments any questions you have, anything you think I might have missed when I transcribed it, um, or suggestions for who you want me to transcribe next. I might make this a series if people like it. Um, so there you go. You can download the transcription for free in the link below. And um, yeah, let's roll the final product.